Okay, so as I said, uh, today we'll talk about uh, this Renaissance uh, architect and artist, then uh, about um, an important uh, Victorian architect, uh, 19th century uh, Britain, Great Britain, and then uh, a very interesting uh, German uh, modern artist who also built. So Bartolomeo Amanati, 1511-1592, actually his birthday was two days ago, but uh, I was lazy then, or I don't know what happened. I, I had some problems with the dentist, so even now I, I hope I can, I can make all the presentation without uh, the pain that is usually associated with uh, stomatological interventions. So he was born uh, on the 18th of uh, June, was an Italian architect and sculptor, and he studied with uh, Bandinelli and Sansovino. He actually contributed to the library of St. Saint, Saint Mark's at uh, Biblioteca Marciana in Venice, a building about which Palladio said was the best building uh, uh, built after uh, ancient Rome, which was not uh, ancient, ancient architecture in general, a great compliment from Palladio. So he was more, more distinguished in architecture than in sculpture. He worked with um, Vignola and Vasari, uh, designs for Villa Giulia, but also worked in the city uh, town of Lucca. Uh, he worked also for the enlargement of the Pitti Palace in Venice, in uh, Florence, sorry, uh, creating the courtyard. Uh, we are going to see it. And he also worked uh, for the Boboli Gardens. Um, and, uh, you know, he was named Consul of Academia dell'Arte del Disegno in Florence. So, uh, in, 19, in 1569, he was commissioned to build the Ponte Santa Trinita, the Saint Trinity, a bridge over the Arno River in Florence. Uh, the three arches are elliptical and, uh, though very light and elegant, has survived when floods <laughs> had damaged other Arno bridges at different times. Santa Trinita was destroyed though in 1944 during World War II and rebuilt in 1957. Some drawings. I mean, all these Renaissance uh, artists uh, drew very, very well, as you know. He was also uh, an important sculptor. Mm, although Michelangelo criticized him, but uh, you'll see, so he did some important works. Sculptures, <clears throat> uh, although he's considered less accomplished, uh, I mean, considered by whom? By Michelangelo, but who knows? The uh, artists are subjective in their interpretations. Anyway, for anyone who visited or visits Florence, this is a, a very important sculptural work right in, uh, in Piazza della Signoria in the center of Florence and uh, not far away from where a copy of David by Michelangelo is. This is called the Fountain of Neptune. And he labored for many years for this fountain. So we are now right in the center of Florence and very close to <clears throat> Uffizi, uh, the offices uh, that uh, uh, Vasari built. I mean, it is said that he, he imitated Michelangelo, but actually in, this, in these cultures, I don't see too much imitation of Michelangelo at all. So 
some sculptures by him are actually remarkable and uh, uh, I don't know very well. Maybe, maybe that's exactly why uh, Michelangelo criticized him because some sculptures by him are actually good like this. Now Bartolomeo Amanati is not so heroic as Michelangelo, but this is not necessarily something bad. I mean, would, would, would you call this, uh, you know, uh, a bad sculptor? <clears throat> I, I felt guilty that uh, we didn't pay homage to him on the 18th, but, uh, you know, two days later we are doing it, so I guess um, the guilt is uh, uh, diminished a little bit. Venus, uh, Venus a variation on the classical type known as Venus Pudica. However, the arms are the result of an 18th century restoration as the original had the arms cut off in order to allow water to flow out. It's about this sculpture or this statue. A dragon, a very moving dragon. Uh, what can we say? You know, the, these Renaissance artists also confronted their own uh, inner demons. Bartolomeo Amanati. Uh, now, just this uh, sculpture that you saw already, a statue. Neptune and other other sculptures by him. The satyr. Okay, now architecture. Um, he didn't build so much, but uh, he contributed to some important buildings. He worked in Rome in collaboration with Vignola and Vasari, including designs for the Villa Giulia. And this is what he did for Villa Giulia. It's called the Loggia of uh, Amanati. Um, but the whole building was not designed by him. almost uh, 500 years ago, 460, 470. The Ducal <clears throat> uh, Palace in uh, Lucca, um, he also, he didn't do the whole thing, but, uh, you know, he's associated with the builders, the designers, the architects who did this palace in Lucca. 16th century Italy. Palazzo Pitti which was not begun by him, but he did some works. He created a courtyard uh, that makes the translation, so to speak, from the palace itself to the Boboli Gardens, which are behind the, uh, the palace. So he did this, these three uh, wings, uh, and then also this uh, fountain here, sculptural fountain. And from here on, 
forward, I mean, towards us, start the famous uh, Boboli Gardens in, in Florence. He was uh, one of the uh, court uh, architects of uh, Cosimo I, the Medici. And uh, as such, he received uh, these commissions. In fact, Cosimo I moved in this building after Bartolomeo uh, did some um, you know, works in the palace. I think he was a good architect. Uh, I mean, from what I see here is uh, very, very convincing. This is the main facade of the PT Palace, but this was not done by him. Quite a, a stern palace. And this is the view. So again, he, he contributed with this, this part. So here on the right, the Boboli Gardens, and if you walked north uh, from here, you would reach uh, um, Uffizi and, and the famous bridge uh, that crosses Arno in, in Florence. Now the St. Trinity Bridge, this is a different bridge which he built and was destroyed during the Second World War. And then uh, it was rebuilt in, um, I don't know, 1957 or so. So he built this, but this was rebuilt based on his drawings uh, after the war. Exactly because it was a very, very valued uh, bridge in Florence. So they rebuilt it exactly as it was before. It survived many floods, but it didn't survive the so-called wisdom of human beings who send bombs and so on, and who create devastating wars. Here it is, <clears throat> after 1944. And here, of course, is the great uh, dome of uh, Brunelleschi. Santa Maria del Fiore. <clears throat> now, uh, this is the uh, very nice work, in my opinion, which was done for Villa di Castello, which was the building where, uh, where Cosimo I was born, his uh, sponsor and patron. and he built for the park of that um, location, this fountain of January, which I think is very nice, uh, is, is this one. <clears throat> Maybe you know that uh, the, the word January comes from Janus the Roman god with two faces who looks both ways. So he's the god of transitions and doorways. And because uh, the year starts in January, uh, it, it was connected with Janus and the word January comes from Janus. I once launched a competition, a house for Janus. So I, I learned a, a few things about Janus. A very interesting uh, god, and uh, there is an arch uh, in uh, in Rome, uh, the, the the arch of, of Janus. But this is, I think, a very nice uh, sculpture or statue by um, Bartolomeo. It is as if he's thinking about, you know, the passage of time, a new year starts, but uh, 
you know, new, stra new troubles start. He seems to be melancholy. I don't know what this thing here is. Maybe uh, there was a fountain and water would come out of his head. I don't know. But anyway, the, 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 the sculpture, I think, is quite uh, moving, uh, the statue. Now, the Jesuit College in Rome was one of Amanati's uh, later designs, 1582, uh, 1584. I only found one image with it. It's a large building in Rome. Maybe not as impressive, but uh, still uh, to build such a building in the 16th century in Rome, it does say something about uh, its, um, its architect. Okay, and now we go to um, a different kind of architect, very prolific, extremely prolific, uh, George uh, Edmund uh, Street, a Victorian architect. He was born today uh, and uh, at, at one moment, I just got tired of, 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 of choosing uh, samples of his work because he built so much. And actually, he died at um, 57. But uh, if he lived uh, for 30 more years, he probably would have covered the whole of England with his buildings. So I only show his new buildings, meaning the new churches. He built so many churches. But it will be a good review, I would say, and add memoir in a way of the neo-Gothic architecture. He was a master of neo-Gothic architecture and important architects uh, trained with him like Philippe Webb. Uh, he was an interesting man and an interesting architect. So as you see, he was born on the 20th of June. Um, George Edmund Street was an English architect born in Essex. Stylistically, Street was a leading practitioner of the Victorian Gothic revival. Though mainly an ecclesiastical architect, he is perhaps best known as the designer of the Royal Courts of Justice on the Strand in London. Unfortunately, that work I do not show. I only show his uh, ecclesiastical works, meaning uh, many of, of his uh, churches. This was the man, uh, and um, he had uh, troubles in his family. Um, his wife died um, in under strange circumstances, and uh, I, he probably suffered a lot. And, and then he concentrated uh, on, on, on this ecclesiastical work. He built so many churches, and then he died himself rather, rather young for an architect. Mr. Street. Victorian architecture is very interesting. I personally love it because I love the Gothic. And I have several presentations about Victorian architecture. Now I regret I didn't include the new, the new law courts, but uh, you will see a lot of churches uh, built by him. Some drawings. Interesting that, you know, the, you would say the Anglo-Saxons are rather cold or, uh, you know, uh, less romantically inclined, but it's not true. The gardens are very romantic, more romantic than uh, the French gardens. And the love of the Gothic architecture also shows, I think, uh, romantic, uh, dispositions. I think this, this drawing is for the court uh, laws, law courts in London. 
again, the, the Gothic uh, architecture has a great impact on him. Now, those of us who like modern architecture maybe are not so inclined to admire this kind of architecture, but I personally, I think it has a, a significant value. And, um, you know, uh, I mean, even the neo-Gothic or the Victorian architecture preceded modernity. And uh, there are elements towards the end of the 19th century of the Victorian architecture that are very, very close to what we call modernity. He was a skilled and, and very hardworking uh, architect. A chair done by him, and I think even the chair shows, uh, shows skill. Now, I only show new churches by him. He also has restorations, but uh, I have 200 images with uh, new churches by G.E. Uh, George Edmund uh, Street. The former parish church of, I don't know what that is, SS Philip and James in Oxford. Maybe the level of innovation is not very high, but uh, Still, it's, 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 a, it's a tremendous uh, effort in the field of ecclesiastical architecture. St. Mary's Church in Bis Biscovi. You will even see a church that was transformed in the, into an apartment building, one of his churches. I love these uh, these churches in uh, you know in small villages. Uh, they are they are uh, uh, I call them romantic. Saint James the Greater Church. And the fact that in the proximity of the church there is also a small cemetery with the with the people that lived in the village. I think. Um, the idea to, to have the cemetery in the proximity of the church is probably a good one. So, the text precedes the picture that you are going to see. Most of these buildings were built with stone. But he built so many tens and tens and tens of churches, incredible. And all of these built by this architect, there were other important architects who built also a lot, a lot, a lot of churches. Truly, the Victorian age was unbelievable in this field. I mean, England is, I mean, Great Britain is covered with such churches. He also built an All Saints Church in Rome, and you are going to see it. In fact, I will end the presentation on him with it. Some are smaller, some are bigger, some in, uh, are in cities, some are in towns, some are in villages. But this man, uh, uh, you know, uh, was, uh, I, I don't know, he probably built every year uh, two or three churches, if not more.
I personally like Gothic architecture, maybe because I, I was born in Sibiu and there are traces of, of the Gothic in Sibiu, but, and I, I lived in the shadow of, the, of the, the evangelical church, so to speak, but it's something about the Gothic that I think is very appealing and the, the Gothic uh, villages and towns are very charming in Romania as well, you know, you think of Sigishwara or uh, parts of Sibiu. Uh, then in Italy, you have great, um, uh, great little towns uh, that are Gothic in, in, in some measure. It was, a uh, we are usually uh, seduced by the post-Renaissance architecture and art, but actually before the Renaissance, there was a, tremendous constructive uh, activity. And then that's when they build the, the, the famous uh, French cathedrals and not only French, of course, but I lived for a while in France and I, I, I lived there exactly because I wanted to be in the proximity of Beauvais, Amiens, Rouen, Reims, uh, Chartres, of course. Uh, the, the, it was an age when uh, the humankind didn't uh, value itself so much, it valued uh, God, and they built for God, and uh, but but even what they built for themselves was not to be ignored. An interesting, different kind of life than ours. Saint Saint Mary's Parish Church and Churchyard in Withley, Oxfordshire. I like also the fact that the stones, uh, the gravestones are so unpretentious, you know, humbly surrounding the church. It is as if man said, you know, uh, all the glory should go to God and I am not so important. So the, the scattered stones are actually uh, testifying about a different kind of relationship between man and God. The church was the house of God, but the, the tomb of, of uh, the grave of, of the human being was not uh, to be glorified. I like this picture. On the left, nature, the trees, in the middle, man, the graves, and on the right, the house of God, the church. Now, you know, all churches normally have the entrance from the west and the altars, uh, the altar as the, the east, uh, the east where the sun comes up. And, um, you know, this is an interesting relationship in a way. You enter the building from west and you move towards the altars which, where, where actually the light comes from because the day starts from the east the sun comes upwards at east and is the symbolism of the sun you know coming upwards and uh, you know of christ or god also bringing light to the world and to the day so that's that's the reason i think where why the churches have this uh, almost strict uh, orientation you enter from the west and you move towards east where the sun is rising So when you enter a church, you turn your back on the setting sun 
and you move towards where a new day begins or where a new um, new life begins. It's 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 the life of of of, of faith. Is the life of of uh, of the beginning. Is the beginning of life. <clears throat> That's also the reason why uh, Christmas Day was moved from January by the church from January to December to. Uh, December 25th, very close to when is the, the winter solstice. Uh, you know, you have the longest night then and the shortest day, but on the, on the winter solstice, the next day, the day begins to grow slowly. And, and uh, it's not an accident that Christmas was chosen to, to be then for the same reason, because it symbolizes uh, the growth of the light, the birth of light, the lengthening of the day. And so it's, it's, uh, it's connecting uh, the birth of Christ with, uh, um, you know, the rejuvenation of, 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 of nature through the growing, slow, slow growing of the day after the longest night. Now these churches, maybe they are not very innovative, uh, but uh, maybe that's, that was not the intention. Not all of them are perhaps remarkable, but uh, I include in them here to show the, the amplitude of, of his effort. I wonder if in the 19th century anyone would have thought that a church would become an apartment building. Probably not, but you are going to see such an example a little bit later on.
this one I couldn't find uh, its name, but I liked it, so I, I included it in the presentation. We don't build so much with stone these days, but uh, maybe, well, there wasn't that there, there isn't so much stone in the world, but uh, it's nice, I think, to to build with stone. So <clears throat> this is uh, George Edmund uh, Street, uh, an important uh, Victorian uh, architect, 19th century, Great Britain. Well, some, some, some churches indeed don't have the spire, and this is one of them. You have to imagine it with the spire.
after a while, one can get a little bit tired. I myself got a little bit tired. I mean, too many churches and very similar in a way. This idea also to have a school in the proximity to part, part of the, what the church is, I think is a good one, you know, to connect education with the, with the service, liturgical service. Here you'll see an example of a church which was transformed into a, an apartment building actually. And uh, I wonder what one feels living inside the church. Here it is, you know. I mean, look at this. The whole church is taken over by, by men, by the human beings. It's probably spectacular, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Uh, this uh, is the central space still being used as a church. No, probably not. Uh, I, I don't know, but it's... Although, on the other hand, I think of the sacred and the profane bring, being brought together, which is something that Mircea Eliade advocated, but it's still a little bit strange. You know, if this is the house of God, then to have you, a human being, a mortal, live in the house of, house of God, uh, well, I guess it depends if you believe or not. If you don't believe, uh, it doesn't matter. But uh, I think this is the first time in history when something like this happens. When, uh, you know, a temple or a church or a cathedral is transformed into a, uh, you know, a secular uh, building. I wonder what uh, um, George Edmund uh, Street would have thought of this.
somebody wrote this, it, it wasn't me. The rocket church uh, expression, you all, uh, you'll understand it why, uh, when, when you see the picture. This is the, it's uh, obviously a new spire. I mean, why not, you know, to add a spire that is modern on top of a building that is from the 19th century. Yeah, it was, it didn't have a, a, its original spire, so they uh, created this um, a new spire. I think the meeting between the old and the new is an auspicious one, is a, is a fruitful one. Harmony through contrast. Don't worry about after so much, uh, you know, uh, Victorian uh, uh, architecture will uh, will arrive at someone thoroughly modern uh, in a few minutes. Who built though? Who built himself uh, the Cathedral of Erotic Miseries, as it was called? A very interesting uh, title. The Cathedral of Erotic Miseries. I don't know if he gave uh, this title to what he did uh, or uh, critic, but I think uh, it's very uh, engaging and provocative. How would the Cathedral of Erotical or Erotic Miseries look like? You'll see. Quite a busy architect, wasn't he?
<clears throat> I love churches and I love the Gothic, but I'm a little bit tired. There are just too many. I should have shortened the presentation with this. Too many churches. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll end this uh, presentation on Easter Street uh, very soon. And maybe such a trip through, you know, this work is um, an adequate, perhaps, uh, reminder of the shortness of life. I mean, you know, we have the church on the right, and then we have the gravestones on the left and the bottom. And, you know, it's, it's um, you know, we think we are eternal, but we are not eternal. It seems even the churches are not eternal since uh, we saw an example of a church that was transformed into an apartment building. Finally, an interior. But uh, these days, as you know, especially in cities, we have office towers, which are uh, by far uh, taller than uh, the spires of the churches. So the triumph of the human being is uh, not to be uh, missed, the so-called triumph. A church without a spire looks a little bit strange, but uh, anyway, sometimes they ran out of money, I imagine, and they couldn't build a, a spire. This will be the last church that I show uh, uh, by this uh, architect, uh, Edmund, uh, George Edmund uh, Street. This is in Rome.
Okay, so uh, George Edmund uh, Street was a Victorian architect uh, who was born on the 20th of June. And now we go to the third presentation of today, a German artist who also built something, a very interesting uh, artist and uh, maybe a good counter uh, part or counterpoint to what we, we saw already. Kurt uh, Schwitzers, uh, Schwitzers, uh, 1887, 1948, uh, very prolific and experimental artist. Uh, this was the man. He was also born, as you can see, on the 20th of June. A German artist was born in Hanover in Germany. Uh, Schwitters uh, worked in several genres and media, including Dadaism, Constructivism, Surrealism, Poetry, Sound, Painting, Sculpture, Graphic Design, Typography, and what came to be known as Installation Art. His most famous, uh, his, he is most famous for his collages called Merz Pictures. But actually, I think he should be the most famous for uh, the Merzbau, uh, uh, the so called Cathedral of Erotic uh, Miseries. And you are going to see it. The truth is, you know, one can admire, one can admire the cathedrals, one can admire the 19th century, one can admire Victorian architecture, one can admire the Middle Ages, but one can also admire, um, you know, the the experimentations of modernity. And I think these collages uh, are a fresh air after too many Victorian churches, I would say. But to use the collage in architecture, this is also far, uh, maybe an interesting idea. This was actually, this artwork was done uh, uh, together with Theo van Dersburg, uh, the founder of uh, the Stiel. Kurt Sweeters. a lot of fragmentation, but this fragmentation has to do with, uh, with the trauma of, uh, you know, living through, through two wars, two world wars. But fragments themselves proclaim themselves from a possible future or a preceding center or order. So the fragment is not necessarily uh, inviting one towards despair, but uh, towards some kind of a, a new beginning or a reconciliation or conciliation. You start from the fragment and then you begin to build something with a certain level of coherence. Important artists uh, claim themselves to, to, to have been influenced and inspired by Kurt Schwitzers like uh, Robert Rauschenberg in the United States and others. Okay, and now we look at, uh, at, at the Metzbau, which is a very interesting uh, architecture, and, and, and it's possible it could inspire. Um, it's, it was um, rebuilt, uh, you'll see pictures also of the original. Uh, this is what a uh, critic called uh, the Cathedral of uh, Erotic Miseries. Uh, it's, is it deconstruction? Um, I don't know, I mean, it is in a way, and it's, it's a deconstruction before deconstruction or before deconstructivism. Uh, but this was built by an artist 
for himself, not for, uh, it's not by an architect uh, building for someone else. Why this would be called the cathedral of erotic uh, miseries, uh, we, can, we can speculate. But uh, most surely most of us uh, know something about what is called erotic miseries. So the, the title is amusing indeed. Especially if associated with the word cathedral. You'll see also uh, a few images uh, forward uh, Merzbau Hotel, um, imagined by someone else, uh, not by uh, Kurt Schwitters. But the truth is how would you see inside one space, inside one room, maybe not the smallest room in the world, but you can, you can create an architecture that is uh, very interesting, like this one, you know. <clears throat> <clears throat> where, where fragments, constructive fragments become ornamental and uh, disjunctive, uh, dynamic, uh, unsettling, uh, interesting. So in a way, the fragmentation he used in his uh, two dimensional works, now he applied to the three dimensional realities of a space. In such a space, you don't need uh, paintings on the walls. You don't have flat white walls. It's a space that is uh, rich, very rich by itself. Don't try it though in school. I'm sure uh, the grade you will receive will not be glorious. But I, 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 would, I would give a good grade to such a work because it shows a lot of imagination and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, quest for uh, complexity. Plus, plus, what we witness here is the, the annihilation of the, of the borders between horizontality and verticality, between the floor and the wall and the ceiling. So it becomes indeed a very interesting in, and engaging interior. It can be done. It can be done and you'll see uh, very soon uh, a so-called project uh, for a uh, hotel, Merzbau, Merzbau Hotel. In a way, what we look at is an escape or an attempt to escape from uh, from uh, the banali banality of, uh, of, of predictability. You know, it's it's a space which is not. I mean, the only recognizable element is this window here. Otherwise, everything is uh, you know new uh, terra nova in a way. It's, 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 it's new, he recreated uh, space. Even the notion of a room is here distorted. Now, this was, I don't know exactly who did this, Hotel Merzbau, Kurt Schwitters, uh, Schwitters in uh, Catalonia, 1952-1957. Again, don't try this in school, but uh, I actually would try it because it, it, it's, I mean, if this was built like this, I think it would be very interesting, don't you think? It is obviously a, a subversive, uh, you know, uh, attempt uh, towards architecture and the subversive influence from, uh, from Kurt Schwitters, but I imagine he would have liked it. 
and indeed, if this is the architect, uh, this is his work. And, uh, <laughs> you know, this, this make, makes me think of the acrobat by Le Corbusier and, and that poem he wrote about the acrobat that is quoted by Doshi, where he says, the acrobat is someone who is risking his life doing something inconceivable by other people. Why is he doing it? Nobody asked him to, to, to do it. Uh, and so he's doing something unusual. And I think we need acrobats. We need, uh, uh, although I know Dan Hangan who criticized the idea of an architect as an acrobat, uh, but uh, I think he was also a little bit jealous of the acrobacies, uh, acrobacies uh, of acrobatic work of uh, Frank Gehry and others like him. You know, he, he was advocating Dan Hanganu, and I have the highest respect for Dan Hangan, but he was uh, advocating uh, the architect as an athlete, uh, not as, a, as an acrobat. But I think also the acrobat is necessary and we need his or her acrobacies. And we need Kurtz, Kurtz with us, with, with his provocations, with his collages with his fragmentations, which in a way proclaim the, 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 the complexity of the world. And these fragmentations become ornamental. They become tapestries in a way and uh, architectonic uh, tapestries. So I, I think they, they there is a potential here to explore these excavations in the in the in the building uh, that that uh, erase uh, the predictability of certain structural or functional, uh, um, you know, uh, programs. Uh, and this is the last picture of this presentation today. Is uh, that I imagine the. Uh, the cover of a book on Kurt Schwiders by Elizabeth, uh, I don't see her name very well there, but I'm sure Gamard. Uh, anyway, she called this Merzbau, the Cathedral of Erotic Misery. And I, I mean, we can talk a lot about this very title. I think it's, it's a very amusing and uh, thought provoking title, the Cathedral of Erotic Misery. But I will let you, uh, you know, with this, uh, with this title and uh, who knows, maybe one day uh, or even today, we can talk a little bit about it. Unfortunately, I can't stay for too long uh, today, but uh, we paid our homages to uh, this, uh, I would say uh, three important uh, uh, architects. One from the Renaissance, one from the Victorian England and one from uh, modernity. Thank you.